And actually, the case I'm going to show you is one I learned a lot at a meeting like this at the end of the day when everybody was heading to the airport already. So um, this isn't necessarily my worst complication ever, <clears throat> but I think it's the one I maybe could uh, hopefully give you some good ideas on if you haven't already used this, uh, this idea. <clears throat> this, is a, this is a patient uh, that had a CTO of the LED and uh, we had treated medically for, for a while already, we, so we knew about the CTO, but continued to have angina. She was relatively young, 60-year-old lady, uh, on good medications with uh, a normal left ventricle, and this actually looked like a fairly straightforward CTO. This is actually a couple of years, two or three years ago, when we had first just uh, received our Gaia wires, so I had never used the Gaia yet. I had done the training, and, it, and um, I was anxious to try it, and we did try kind of more standard wires first. We tried to uh, an XT and a pilot with a microcatheter, but we, we kept getting in, in the wrong little branches with everything. We weren't quite ever engaging the CTO, and instead of doing our usual where we might, you know, knuckle or, or try to get subintimal and make sure we're still in the right architecture, we decided to try the Gaia. Uh, so I just give this as a, an example of kind of what can happen both with the Gaia and if you and I, I didn't have a fellow with me that, you know, sometimes we have fellow scrub with us uh, and sometimes not, uh, but at the, that time, it was, this is all me, so I own this one completely. But I'll just show you that uh, we brought a Gaia down. It looked like in multiple views that it was in the right architecture, and so we bring a cross boss down. And this is, you know, if you do go out of the architecture with a wire, especially a penetrating wire, which the guy is maybe not as likely to get you in trouble as a Pro-12 or a Hornet, but it'll still penetrate, especially if you don't have a lot of calcium. And so the wire went extravascular, and I made the mistake of following it with the cross boss, something you try hard to get through your career without ever doing. But we just couldn't quite feel good about the architecture. I lost visualization very well of the distal vessel. So we ended up going in a lateral. You can see she's got old stents in her right coronary, but if you watch this carefully, you'll see the LED come in late, right over here, and the cross boss is up above the LED. So I don't know, there it is, right there. Just for a second, you see the LED, but it's about five millimeters clearly out of the architecture. So, so we knew we had a perforation uh, at, the, at this point. It's sealed by the cross boss, but we know if we pull it back, we're gonna have a problem. And uh, this is not the kind of perforation, you know, we have all kinds of things to, to use for perforations now. And, and uh, actually we've had uh, the Jomed uh, uh, graft master type stint on our shelves since it came out. We had almost never used them. Um, and this is a case you can't really use that in because uh, you're just going to go right, you're just gonna make the hole bigger. So we have to, to figure out what to do. On this case, we actually had a little time because she was doing fine, we called Echo and we decided to carefully pull it back and just see exactly whether we were gonna be lucky or not lucky. And I'll just show you, uh, this is what it looks like. So this doesn't look like a, a big picture, big perforation. This is actually a little ways into the case. We had already had the balloon up quite a while. Uh, once we pulled it back, you could see her pressure go down pretty quickly. It took maybe five minutes, but then each, each heartbeat, her pressure on the uh, screen went down systolic. So uh, just as her pressure got a little under 100, uh, we went ahead and stuck the pericardium. And you can see up here, we sedated her a little extra. You can see the pericardial drain just off the, uh, the edge of the heart here. And then we tried pretty hard to do a, a long inflation. Uh, I would say the vast majority of perforations, even, even significant ones, ones that scare you bad, you can, you can seal the vast majority with a long inflation. And sometimes that might mean a 30 minute inflation if they can handle it or even longer. And letting the heparin wear off, we try not to reverse the heparin when someone has gear in place. You know, if the ACT is way off and we really feel compelled to give protamine, we give a tiny dose, but uh, I think we try to do it without protamine. So in this case, we actually did a couple of very long inflations just because I was confident I could get it to seal, but it wouldn't seal. And, uh, and I had just a couple weeks earlier been to a meeting in Seattle where they, uh, one of the CHIP meetings, and, uh, and just at the very end, uh, uh, Aaron Grantham had mission, mentioned a whole laundry list of things you can do for perforations. You can, you know, you can use coils, and I think if you're doing complex cases, it's not a bad idea to have coils available. You can use um, thrombin or thrombin beads. They make thrombin beads that you can inject right in there, or you can do something 
that all of us have. We have those available, but uh, we like the idea of putting something down there to seal it, but I didn't really want to put coils. So here's after a couple of very long inflations. You can see uh, this is like a one cc injection or two cc injection, so this perforation would look a lot bigger if we did a real firm injection, but it's still there. So what we did is we uh, opened up the area where we'd gone into the groin, the arteriotomy site. We just made an extra couple millimeters on the skin and put our, our uh, snap right into that incision and pulled a tiny bit of fat out, cut the fat up. It typically looks you know, like this. You can cut it up a little more. You know, it's hard to get in a microcatheter to deliver, so usually you have to kind of pull it into the, like a 3cc syringe with some saline, and it floats. So if you just try to inject it, it may not float correctly, so you kind of have to push it up or point, point up when you, when you push the fat into your microcatheter, get the air out, and then you push, if the fat floats up, you can push it into your microcatheter. And then in this case, you can do different ways, but we used a, a wire to just push the fat down to the tip of the microcatheter. So we used, and you, you, you might, you know, look at your microcatheter, see what you have. You can use a 14 thousandths, an 18 thousandths is easier to deliver fat through just because it's, it's hard to deliver. Uh, we have an 18 thousandths uh, end hole catheter for delivering coils. So if you have coils, you probably, you probably have a catheter like that. I think ours is called, called a cantata uh, from Cook. And uh, you can see what it looks like here. But here's what the catheter looks like. It's just got a little marker on the end. And we actually just, you can't see the fat under fluoro, obviously. So you just put it into your lumen of, your, of this catheter. And then you push it out. You'll be able to see your, your wire, the radiopaque tip of your wire. It pushes right out the tip. And uh, we just pushed a couple of tiny pieces out. And then we take the catheter out, and it's sealed nicely. So uh, our peripheral guys use this also sometimes when they get a significant perforation in the leg. So it's just something to, to think about. All of us have fat, so even if you don't have coils and beads and you get caught in a, uh, a tough spot. About a, a week after I showed this to somebody, I got a, a call from Michigan where someone sent a picture of a big perforation in the mid-right mid when they were del delivering one of the um, bioabsorbable stents. And it was an um, impressive perforation from all sides. And uh, he wanted to know about using fat there. But obviously, you can't use fat there because you'll shut off the whole vessel and cause an infarct. So this is more if you have a distal perforation, a wire perforation, things like that. You know, sometimes your wire will go out a distal branch and you need to seal it. It can work great for that. Um, I will just tell you, by the time I called him back, which is just a little bit later, 15 or 20 minutes, they had already sealed that impressive perforation with the long inflation. So I think you can still get a lot of perforations to seal with long inflations. Um, so always try that uh, first. Plus, it helps decrease the, uh, the amount of blood you're putting in the pericardial space. And I think that's really the key things. Any, any questions or comments from the panel? Yeah, or? maybe some quick comments from the panel uh, about not only the management of it, how to potentially avoid it. And it's actually a really instructive case for a specific type of perf. I think there are several perfs going to be presented. This is one that's uh, you know related to advancing microcatheter into a space that isn't uh, in the true lumen. Any, any thoughts from the panel? Yeah, the, <clears throat> the only thing I would say is if you ever get in a scenario, and I'm sure you all thought about this, if you ever get in a scenario where you don't want to push a, pull a catheter because they're going to bleed, uh, in, in, as in this situation, you can think about um, using the ping, ping pong technique, mm -hmm. uh, get access to another artery, engage uh, the left main with a separate catheter wire, and then put a, a small balloon at the edge before the, the perforation, if you want to try to avoid bleeding to the pericardium. Yeah, I mean, especially when you have the wire down and you're taking the cross boss out uh, in the time interval there, that's a very important time. A few things I, I just mentioned uh, real briefly. Number one is that um, this is a case there's no dual injection, and so it's tough to know where you were when you were going, and it may be because there's no collateral from the right side. Yeah, I should have mentioned that. There, were no, there was nothing. So even when we brought this patient for her true CTO, we did a good injection because I didn't see it on the diagnostic films from, you know, from an outside hospital. We did a good injection with a large guide, and there was just nothing, nothing going through the right. LED. So it was all left-to-left -left collateral, so we just did a single guide. You're right. It would have been usually you'll have two guides in 90% of the time. You'll have two guides. What we'll sometimes do in these circumstances to be able to visualize a collateral distally is you can wire the diagonal branch or figure out where the ipsilateral collaterals are coming from. In this case, it may be septal, septal, or diagonal, and you can put a microcatheter in there and do selective injections through the microcatheter so that you do have a dual without actually having a second guide. 
I think the other aspect is that once you have a wire down and you take the microcatheter through and you recognize the perf, don't ever pull that wire back. And the reason is, is that in order to advance fat, coils, beads, whatever you're going to advance into there, if you have wire position, you can always get back in there and then deploy it there. Once you've lost your wire position, then to maybe get back into that plane can be hard, and then you, you end up having to deal with other options in order to, uh, to deal with it. Um, the final thing I'll mention is in terms of how to embolize and what to embolize with. Get familiar with something. It's often useful to talk to your IR folks about what they use. But just be cognizant that if you have a perf that's going anywhere other than the pericardium, i.e. it's going into a cavity, those are cases you do not want to inject thrombin, you do not want to inject beads, you don't want to inject anything like fat that will then embolize into a cavity and then potentially give you a stroke. So you have to be confident that it's a pericardial or a subadventitial bleed in order to be able to do one of those injecting techniques. Right. Uh, how do you know you've, you've made it enter your microcatheter? So, not pushed it out the end? Or the so, we kind of did it very just, so it's hard a little bit to push it because it doesn't want to go that first millimeter or two, so you don't want that whole three cc's to, to jump in there. So, the question is, how do you get that fat going? And on this one, we just kind of did it so we, I had a little bit control of the syringe, so I had to push pretty firm but I had it so I wouldn't push the whole thing in once it yeah, went. So, put a Kelly just yeah, that's a good idea too, if you're you jumping too far. I've, yeah. I've, I've never actually done this, but I wonder if you can impregnate the, the piece of fat with contrast just to make You can, it. so people, can. people are doing that some so they can see the fat go yeah. down. So that's another thing is they'll, they'll put a little bit of contrast on the fat or they'll push it down with fluid or fat. Um, I kind of liked the concept of doing it with the wire just because we, you know, that's how we would p deliver a coil. You know, you just kind of uh, put a detachable coil down that way. The negative of coils in this case is then you're leaving a lot of gear in there, a lot of hardware if you ever want to go back, which we did eventually on this lady and open her up. Uh, the other thing is if you're doing thrombin, you know, thrombin is oh, pretty, pretty wonderful for groin pseudoaneurysms, but if you're injecting it anywhere in the coronary, you've got, you've got to just... It's just scary. Yeah, you take I just everything think, out as soon as you, you do yeah. it. Everything's out, including so, the guide. I agree. So there's, uh, and they do have the beads now. I haven't used the beads, but uh, I've talked to people that uh, have I used them some. If you had injected clot, just took you know, some famous blood and let it clot, put some clot down there, it might have made it easier that when you came back to get through there. It may have. It may have. I, I, uh, I don't know. I did, the fat was a pretty small amount, and theoretically, um, it's, yeah, it seemed to work uh, really well. We still have that little bitty uh, lip of the LED sticking off that septal there, so um, I was impressed that it didn't lose the septal or the diagonal. It was able, we were able to deliver it right there between them, so I think um, and the nice thing is everybody has a little bit, uh, no matter how thin they are, so it's handy and cheap. And actually, in this lady, since we had time, we were able to sedate her a little extra. She didn't even know the next day that she had it. She didn't realize that drain was... She uh, didn't remember the whole uh, thing, so it was kind of kind of nice and easier to get her to get the next get it done the next time. Any other comments? If not, we'll move on to the next case. But that was a great you. presentation. Thanks so much.